Hello, good afternoon. My name is Henry Song. I'm the Director of Government Relations here at One Korea Network. Welcome, everybody. And if you didn't grab your lunch, please grab your lunch in the back. Um, it is my great honor to welcome all of you to our inaugural Congressional Luncheon Series. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Arthur Lee, who will uh, introduce our event, the speakers. And uh, welcome and enjoy. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you so much for taking time to come to join us for lunch. Uh, my name is Arthur Lee. I'm a director of One Korea Network is Washington, D.C. office. Today's event is One Korea Network is first the congressional luncheon and we'll be holding a luncheon series on a bi-monthly basis on a brighter, variety of national security, economic sanctions, cyber security, and human rights issues in the Indo-Pacific region. So, Please look out for them. Also, special thanks to Congressman Ronnie Jackson's office, Megan Porter and Katie Waller, who helped us arrange this beautiful venue. Today we have, a, we have an amazing panel on China and its attempt to capture the Pacific Island, where the speakers will be talking about how the United States and Quad and then South Korea can respond to the CCP threat in the region. But before we dive into the panel session, I'd like to make a brief introduction of One Korea Network and share a two-minute video of shocking news that happened in South Korea. Um, One Korea Network is committed to combating the growing threats to dem democracy in South Korea by su uh, supporting policies, building educational campaigns, and foreign relations with lawmakers that will protect the cultural values and national security of South Korea and the United States and the med, uh, other indo pacific uh, regions. And now we will watch two minute video clip. In November 2019, South Korea's Moon administration forcibly repatriated two North Korean fishermen who had defected to South Korea. Recently, the Unification Ministry under the new President Yoon said that the two defectors had written a 20-page statement, expressing their will to stay in the South. Recently released photos and videos show that they physically resisted, and even inflicted injury on themselves not to cross the border at Panmunjom. This contradicts what the Moon administration's officials had asserted in the past. Chung Yu-yong, then Blue House National Security Advisor, testified at the National Assembly in 2021 that the two fishermen were unwilling to defect to South Korea. Then Unification Minister Kim Yun-chul also said that the fishermen had expressed to die in their home country if they had to. Additionally, then-National Intelligence Service Chief Suhoon forcibly closed the joint investigation into the case in just a few days. Moreover, on the same day of the repatriation, President Moon sent a letter to North Korea's Kim Jong-un inviting him to South Korea. Experts say that the two defectors would have been killed or sent to a political prison in the North. This case clearly violates the South Korean Constitution, which considers North Koreans as its citizens. It is also against the UN Convention Against Torture and the UN Refugee Convention, which obligates not to send anyone back to a country where the person can be harmed. While North Korea's closest ally Communist China has always forcibly repatriated North Korean defectors, it is the first time that South Korea, a free, democratic country under a human rights lawyer president with his slogan, People Come First, sent back the defectors against their will. Since I'm a North Korean escapee, so I would like to take this moment to share 
the tragedy happened in South Korea a few years ago. It's very un um, terrible and unacceptable act, no different from the possible repatriation of North Korean defectors by the CCP and the Russian government for years was carried out by the South Korean progressive government. Honestly, all North Korean defectors cried all day. And I will stop here about the video introduction. I want to uh, say our goal today is whatever your, your role is in the office, that you will learn with something, your idea, a fresh perspective, a new strategy that you can apply to the most successful in your congressional work and national security of the United States and its allies. Now I will introduce our amazing speakers. Um, they are leading experts on this timely topic. Um, Grant Mushin, U.S. Mori retired U.S. Marine Corps Colonel and Executive Director at One Korea Network. And Cleo Pascal, Senior Fellow for the in the Pacific at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. I'm sure you can read more of uh, their bios on the program flyers. Clear, floor is yours. Thank you. Th thank you very much, and thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy days to, to come and join us. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be here and grateful to uh, Representative Chuck's office and to One Korea Network for this opportunity. Who has been to the Pacific Islands? Okay, where'd you go? So, yeah, okay. Here. <laughs> Want me to guess? Guam? Uh, <laughs> America? Yeah. Uh, no. yeah. Uh, Guam, Kiribati, oh. uh, PNG. Excellent, good. So you know what's going on there. It's not, uh, it's not great. And um, I'm going to talk, it's a very, very big area. Um, and it's changing incredibly quickly. This is a picture of the uh, Prime Minister of the uh, Solomon Islands uh, taken very recently with the ambassador from China and the uh, police trainers that have just shown up in his country to uh, help him with his domestic security situation, which exists because he's created such a strong relationship with China. But first we'll talk a little bit about the area and uh, how big it is. Next slide, please. So if you superimpose the continental United States over the Pacific, you can see we're talking about a very large area. We've got uh, Maine up near where Hawaii is, and you still don't get all the way across to cover all of the Pacific Islands. It's operationally really complicated area, very large. And the islands, the Pacific Islands themselves are very diverse. Next one, please. So uh, you can go from a country like Tonga, where you have uh, not that much development, especially outside the capital, to places like Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea, which Papua New Guinea has a larger population and is a larger geographically than New Zealand. Quite big. So the countries are really different. And I'd suggest picking up a copy of uh, the East West Center's little briefing booklet out front, which gives you very useful practical information on the countries themselves. What you will find across the region are, uh, oops, can you go back, please? are Chinese shops. And that's um, uh, one commercial entry point, which is very visible. Uh, but there are many other forms of Chinese engagement in the region that is uh, all the way up to amphibious forces arriving in Tonga when they have a volcano showing up. I mean, they're, they're kind of they're everywhere. The people of the Pacific Islands are used to being part of this strategic competition. Next slide, please. So this is a drawing from 1899 Punch magazine of Germany, the UK, and the US fighting over Samoa. Um, they know geopolitics. In many cases, it's family history. So the current King of Tonga is a direct descendant of the King of Tonga that negotiated with the Americans and the Germans and the British in, the, in 1875 and onwards. Uh, they're knowledgeable and sophisticated. That's sort of kind of a broad overview of the region. But to get a sense of that trend line, that geopolitical trend line, we're going to take one location. Next slide, please. We're going to take Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands. So did you, did you, go, to, did you go to Kwajalein, sir? Uh, stop through. You stopped through, yeah. So Kwajalein is very important for uh, US strategic positioning in the region. Um, going to go quickly through its history. First of all, for a couple thousand years, it sort of did its own thing. 
much of the population of the region is ethnically related to uh, the Taiwanese indigenous populations. Then, next slide please. You get the kind of colonial period where first they had Spain and then they had the Germans. Uh, this is a familiar picture from the colonial period just about everywhere. And then uh, the Germans lost World War I and the area, next slide please, was given over to Japan as part of the South Sea Mandate. So um, I'm going to go over to the thing. This whole area was administered by Japan. Very, very large, uh, important and strategic area. And uh, it was administered. There were a lot of Japanese fishermen. There was a lot of economic engagement. And it developed into a narrative. Uh, next slide, please. From the Japanese side of this greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere, where uh, there are these colonial, other colonial influences, like the British and the Americans, and they're making life miserable for the locals. And if only the Japanese were there, and everybody was under the Japanese flag, next slide, please, it, everybody would be happy. Oops, go back, please. So this is very similar to what uh, you're here. It's not the same, but the language is similar to what the Chinese are saying now that you're being exploited by the Australians and the New Zealanders and the Americans. And uh, if we just had this kind of unification <laughs> under the Chinese flag, everything would be fine. Well, we know what happened with the uh, Japanese. Next slide, please. This is Kwajalein Atoll again, just uh, as it was being liberated by the Americans. Um, this, uh, <laughs> there were about 5,000 Japanese and enslaved Koreans who were working for the Japanese who were killed on this tiny atoll that we've been talking about and uh, over 117 Americans killed a thousand wounded after after World War II this area next slide please understanding how strategic it was was designated a trust territory by the United Nations it's the only strategic area trust territory that existed. It was known to be so strategic, it was designated its own thing and given to the United States to administer. That these are uh, countries that are now Palau, Marshall Islands, uh, Federated States of Micronesia. And what America did in, in Kwajalein, next slide please, is use it as a command center for things like the nuclear tests in Bikini Atoll. So over the course of uh, that early phase of the Trust Territories, about 67 nuclear detona detonations happened in the Marshall Islands. And it is still, next slide please, very important. This is Kwajalein now, this is the Ronald Reagan uh, ballistic missile defense test site. So you're looking at just one spot. Each of these countries has their own stories. It went from Spain to Germany to Japan to uh, UN Trust Territory to uh, independence, and then to, next slide please, what it is now, which is one of the freely associated states with the United States, Compacts of Free Association. Do you, who, who knows the term COFA, Compact of Free Association? Okay. Well, Congress has been incredibly important with uh, making sure that this stays on track. This is a completely unique relationship with the three countries that I just mentioned, Palau, Marshall Islands, and Ferris States, and Micronesia. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so there's three compact states. They're either called the COFA states, Compacts of Free Association, or FAS states, the FAS states. That's just free association state. Next slide, please. People who live there, they're not U.S. citizens, these are independent countries, but they can work in the U.S., serve in the U.S. military, which they do at very high rates, um, and they get financial support from the United States. Next. Uh, this is a unique defense and security relationship. The U.S. doesn't have this relationship with anybody else. The U.S. is responsible for the defense and security of these countries. Next slide. Um, you get a huge return on your investment. This is not a lot of money. This is, uh, I, mean, I can't remember what the amounts are, but sort of tens of millions. And you get this area, which is the size of the continental United States, right behind Taiwan and the Philippines, where the U.S. gets to operate out of. Next. It underpins the entire U.S. defense posture in Asia, and it moves the front line between Asia and the Americas. If it w weren't for the COFA states, it would be Hawaii. 
This moves the front line right off to, to this area, which is also where Guam is, which is U.S. territory with U.S. citizens. Next. Um, it was an incredible human cost for the U.S. to have this relationship. Uh, I showed, showed you some of the men that died in Kwajalein, but I think uh, over 100,000 Americans died in the Pacific Theater. I think 50,000 were missing. It was a huge cost to liberate this area and to gain this area. And if it's lost, getting it back would be uh, inconceivable. Next. Without it, uh, Japan, the Philippines, Australia, and South Korea become very hard to defend. And just to show the level of integration, you might be wondering why there's a picture of the post office there. Um, the U.S. handles the postal service for the coastal, for the, for the COFA countries. They have U.S. zip codes. It is considered domestic mail. And this is very important for the people of the region because as their service members are in the U.S. or working in the U.S., they can send packages home and things like that at, at, at very low cost. Um, this is the importance of this region may be less known in the U.S. The Chinese definitely know it. Uh, next, please. So uh, we talk about the island chains, the first island chain, second island chain. Colonel Newsham will talk about it a little bit more. Uh, but as far back as 2008, Admiral Keating was testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he told, he told the committee that a senior Chinese officer had said to him, why don't we reach an agreement, you and I? You take Hawaii East, and we'll take Hawaii West. We'll share information, and we'll save you the trouble of deploying your naval forces west of Hawaii. China wants to push the front line to Hawaii. And one of the reasons that they can't is because of the relationships between the U.S. and the Pacific Islands as a whole, but specifically with the Kofa states, with the Marianas, and with Guam. And Colonel Newsham will tell you a little bit more about that. Thanks very much for coming. We appreciate the, you taking the time. Uh, I'll, we're pressed for time, so I'll move right along. Uh, what is the Chinese objective um, in, the, in the region? It's to get the Americans out. Uh, they want to uh, displace the United States and dominate the region themselves. Um, just listen to what they've said. And, uh, and in fact, I would encourage everybody to take about a week and read the English language Chinese press, Global Times, China Daily, take your pick, and see what they're saying. And listen to the tone of it, and listen to actually what they are saying about America and what they want the Americans to do. Uh, that would be really instructive um, to get a sense of the vitriol and the venom. But that is what the Chinese want to do. And you really don't have to be uh, a military expert or really even have any military experience to understand the sort of the security importance of these islands. And let me demonstrate this. You just have to look at a map. Now here, right here is the, the so-called first island chain. And these are, it goes from Japan down to Taiwan to the Philippines and then down to Malaysia to Borneo. And the U.S. defense line is basically, our, our position in Asia is basically along the first island chain. And we are defending along there. We have uh, large bases in Japan. Uh, we are counting on the Taiwanese. We would like the Filipinos to help us uh, sort of hold the line. And so that's where we're sort of conceptually and physically, we're lined up to defend there. Now, look at where the, the Pacific Islands are. And I think you can see the problem. Uh, the Pacific Islands are behind the first island chain. And that, you can see the, the obvious usefulness of that. Uh, if you can get beyond the first island chain, you've set up in the rear of U.S. defenses, right in the middle of it. Uh, and you have the, the possibility of operating freely to the east. Uh, up, you can operate up to the north. You can surround Japan. You can operate down to the south. Uh, you can cut off Australia. And beyond that, you can actually, you can get the Americans on the back, if you play it right, you can get them on the back foot and trying to defend from about Hawaii, uh, if they're lucky, and that's for starters. Uh, and it, geography really does matter uh, in this region. And I say, if you look at the map and you get a sense of where the first island chain is, and you can really understand this. And I would note there's also a second island chain 
uh, which goes from Japan down through Guam to uh, New Guinea, Australia, depending on how you count. There's even a third island chain. And you can see what the problem is when you have Chinese presence popping up in these Pacific islands. Uh, it causes you some real, it, you, you can see the problem, but also the Chinese have, they're not just looking uh, to the east, but, uh, and when they do look to the east, keep in mind, they're looking all the way to the west coast of Latin America. And the idea is to eventually uh, be able to operate in the entire region and to, uh, as I said, displace the United States. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but that is the objective. But also from a Chinese perspective, if you can set up in the Central Pacific and beyond, uh, what happens to Taiwan? Uh, it gets very difficult for the United States to, and its friends to support Taiwan because they're so busy trying to fight their way through uh, Chinese presence uh, in the Pacific region. And Taiwan is the, the real key for, that is uh, the, the immediate prize that the, that the Chinese want. Now, in terms of the Chinese presence, you know, we talk about this presence in the region uh, and on the Pacific Islands, uh, it follows a predictable sequence. And you, you'll see it play out just about everywhere. Uh, you always see it play out the same way in the United States. Um, but it starts with commercial influence, uh, commercial pre presence. There will often be investments, there will be grants and money pr put in. And this, you'll get Chinese people coming with that. And the commercial presence, it really goes down even to the corner level shop uh, and all the way up. It, it is uh, wide ranging. And a commercial presence and a financial presence gives you political influence. And what this does in the, every one of these islands, it builds a constituency that sees China as the, the beneficial partner. And they have, a, say, it builds a dependency on them. Uh, basically, you want their money. Uh, and say it plays itself in the, the political uh, realm as well. And what just happened recently in the Federated States of Micronesia, uh, for example, um, in Yap, which is um, strategic territory if there ever was, the governor was in, impeached recently, uh, really at the behest of uh, working through uh, local, uh, local politicians at the behest of a Chinese resort group. And this is ro royal the politics of the region, but it's a good example of how the, the commercial leads to political influence. And the Chinese are very active di diplomatically. You know, they have a lot of uh, embassies and they're well staffed and they're, um, they do better at it than we do. Uh, but the th there's a third piece of the puzzle, and it's commercial, political, and it's the military part. And that's been sort of slow to come. Uh, the Chinese have taken their time to set things up. Uh, but it's, it's, it will, it's coming, and we just saw it uh, happen. It's coming uh, most obviously in the Solomon Islands, uh, where they just, and Cleo will talk about that later. But that's the third piece of the puzzle. The Chinese have been searching for places where they can set up uh, bases or have access uh, for military purposes. But uh, while they've been slow in that, in that regard, um, the, they have been uh, very active actually in sending out survey ships, spy ships, uh, and uh, tracking ships uh, throughout the region. Uh, but also they've set up a pretty good sensor network as well. Uh, they put some into the Marianas Trench uh, near Guam, not too, a few years ago. And they're, they say that they are, uh, setting themselves up and before long you are going to see a more active Chinese presence, military presence in more places uh, uh, more often. And the Chinese buildup uh, is, is the biggest, fastest military buildup in world history. Uh, they have, for a country that faces no enemies, it's been even more impressive. Uh, but they do have the ability that is grow, growing to project power. And that means that you can uh, uh, exert military influence farther from your shores. Historically, or in recent times, they've been pretty much limited to within the first island chain, but they're rapidly developing uh, the capability to get beyond that. And that's what you need if you're going to add the military component to this uh, Pacific presence. Uh, the Chinese also have a fishing fleet, which is huge, and it serves as an adjunct to their military forces. They have something called the maritime militia, which if you think of fishing boats that are actually intended to, to fight. Uh, they've got a lot of these, and they're all over the place. 
Um, and the fishing fleet serves already as a sort of reconnaissance. Um, it serves for sig signals intelligence purpose, and a fishing boat handles, and it can easily, if you set it up right, it can handle an anti-ship missile. And you can see the problems there. Nobody expects to have their, their boat, shre their ship shredded uh, by a Chinese fishing boat, but they are getting it, things in place, uh, and it, it poses a real risk uh, to, the, uh, to the United States, but the U.S. military seems to have had a, sort of been slow to realize the, the actual threat posed by the Chinese presence. Uh, but you have to play it out a certain, uh, play it out a little bit, and you can understand the threat even better. Uh, and this all has a psychological effect. Um, when you see the Chinese building up this commercial presence, the physical presence, it, it suggests there's a, it's an inexorable. Uh, it can't really be stopped. But also it shows that in a lot of these island countries, in all of them, in fact, it looks like the only alternative. Uh, there's just nothing else but much going on besides the Chinese presence. Now, where's the United States in all of this? Uh, you know, our biggest bases are, are in Japan. Korea, and you'll see that where those are, and these are way up here. Uh, we do have presence in Guam, which is useful, of course, but we don't have very much else. Uh, there are, thank you, and, and there are places where we can, can operate, but we say we don't really have the physical presence. Uh, and that's uh, obviously is a, a huge problem. What we do, we do a lot of activities in the region. And we'll go through and we'll do, say, do an exercise or stop off and do a port call. But we're a little bit like the Harlem Globetrotters who show up, put on a good show, and then we're gone. And if you look at it from a local perspective, well, the Americans came and it was fun and they left. But who's always here? Well, there's the Chinese people you know, who are always around. And so that's something that, that needs some um, help. And Cleo mentioned that there's treaties which give us the right to get into... Uh, to handle the defense in certain places, three of the, the COFA states. Now, a treaty is a treaty. And what happens if somebody says, oh, we don't want you here? Do we send in the Marines uh, to enforce it? Um, you can see the problem. And if the Chinese have created a constituency within an island that doesn't want us there, it makes it very difficult politically for us to operate. Something similar happened in Puerto Rico. Uh, some years back in a place called Vieques, where we had a treaty, but we were forced out because of popular uh, opposition. Now, the last thing I want to mention very quickly, it's an example, it's Saipan. And to give you a sense of how this presence can actually have a blocking effect on our military uh, opportunities. And Saipan is a small island near Guam, and the um, uh, Americans wanted to have an amphibious combined arms training area on one of the small islands up, this, up the Marianas chain called Pagan. And it would, this would be the only place the Americans owned in the entire sort of west of Hawaii where they could do, uh, the train, they could do this kind of training. Uh, they, oh, they had, there was opposition to it, but the opposition didn't just spring out of the earth uh, sort of fully formed. Uh, what you, the way it worked is, you, in 2014, a Chinese casino company came to Saipan, said, we're going to invest billions of dollars into this place. And there's only 50,000 people on Saipan. The economy was in trouble. The casino company comes, and they actually make a huge contribution to the National Pension Fund, or the State Pension Fund. And they also pay everybody's electric bill. And this, is go and this is going to be the, the future. And suddenly you get even more opposition to this US, to the Marine uh, Navy um, amphibious training idea. And environmental groups get involved, and even off-island ones. And so they've all been supercharged by Chinese money. And eventually, they, the Americans had to give up on the idea. Uh, the um, Chinese did in the after 2018 election, just before the election started, the governor had $20 million uh, that he spread around, and it, it was all casino money. Three and a half million went to give re retirees a pay increase, and 125,000 went to, some, to a, um, a, a group called the Marianas Political Status Commission, uh, which was intended to study ways for Saipan to uh, cut its relationship with the United States. So, as I say, you can see how the presence, even without a direct military one, can have an effect uh, on U.S. Uh, security uh, position in the region. 
Uh, so very quickly, back to Cleo. Okay. I have more good news. Um, by the way, the, uh, 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 Colonel Newsham wrote about this for a uh, CSBA thing, which is out, of, out front. So if you want more details on that, that's out front. Um, uh, and if you could just go back a second. Yeah, so, and just to explain this, so everything that's red is basically U.S. Not, not the COFA states, actually U.S. Uh, and blue is France. So if you're looking at kind of who's in the area, it might not be people you expect if you haven't looked at the area before. And the realm of New Zealand is, is orange. New, Ze New Zealand's kind of interesting that way. And we happen to have with us one of the top experts from New Zealand, uh, making us all a little nervous, Professor Anne-Marie Brady, um, who's, uh, who, who's good, and in fact, I'm gonna run through this next slide because this is her area. Um, so uh, we talked about, uh, uh, Colonel Newsham talked about the Chinese coming in and uh, essentially this slide from goodwill to support to dependency and uh, how they do it and and the result and the result one of the results was in 2019 two countries flipped from Taiwan to China one of them was Kiribati and the other was Solomon Islands we'll talk about the Solomon Islands first but the way that they do it hey just go through here so you know there are things like just to give you an example um, Guangdong is, is area of China has been designated as one of the important uh, entry points for relationships with the Pacific Islands. There are multiple think tanks in Guangdong that just focus on the Pacific Islands. So it's not diffuse within the bureaucracy. There's a very focused uh, attempt to engage. Um, next, you know, they, the diplomats learn the local language. The current Tongan amba Chinese ambassador in Tonga was in the embassy years ago as a junior. He speaks Tongan. He came back as the ambassador. People know him. They have these old relationships next. The other thing to, to note, as uh, Colonel Lucian was saying, was you, you, we often talk about dual use, uh, you know, commercial and military. There's this third element, which is corruption, and they come braided together. And actually, the, the corruption line of it is the, is a vulnerable spot for them. And we can get to that later. Uh, there's loans, uh, visas, r casinos are easy. I mean, just a whole, we can actually go right to the end. Um, it's just a very comprehensive policy for engaging through political warfare that gives the sort of access that you get, next slide please, uh, in, a, in, a, in a place like the Solomon Islands when they switched recognition. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about what it does to a country when they start to engage with China in this way. It's very relevant for the, for the North Korean thing we talked about. You're starting to see things across the region like uh, Chinese prisoners being sent back to China with no trial. We saw it in Fiji, I think we saw it in Vanuatu, right? A, a, few, a few different places where just people are, we, there, there's no public case. We don't know what they're doing. They're loaded on a plane and they're sent back to China. In the Solomon Islands, they switched recognition uh, next, and it was not popular locally. And this is something that's very also important for knowing how to push back. One of the provinces, Malaita province, put out this communique. This was the, the provincial leadership supported by the uh, traditional chiefs. And one of the things that they said is very interesting. They, they said no CCP-linked companies in their province. And one of the reasons was they acknowledge the freedom of religion as a fundamental right and further observes the entrenched Christian beliefs and belief in God by the Malaitan and Malaitan Outer Islands peoples and therefore rejects the Chinese Communist Party and its formal system based on atheist ideology. They realize that this is an ideological battle and that it has the potential to fundamentally change their societies. And so, uh, next slide please. You get situations like this is the premier of Malaita province, Premier Sudani. He got very sick. Uh, he was the premier from the province that put out that communique and he needed medical care. And um, the central government would not fund his medical care. He needed an MRI. He had to go to Australia for it. There's no MRI machine in the country. Um, and he was told, accept China in your heart and you're going to get the money for your medical treatment. And he said, no. So if you want to see somebody who's willing to die rather than give in to the Chinese Communist Party, that's Premier Daniel Sudani and other people in the Pacific. So they're bad guys in the region, but they're also some exceptional people. Of course, this didn't stop China. Next slide. 
So they, uh, this is very comprehensive way of engaging. They bought up 39 out of the 50 members of parliament. The locals were saying, people like local leader uh, uh, Ken Luria, who's the son of the first independent prime minister, said this is going to lead to violence. If you let the Chinese do this in the Solomons, this is going to lead to violence. Next slide. And it led to violence. So, you know, in November we had these riots. Um, they, they seemed, the rioters ended up burning down a bunch of downtown, specifically the Chinese sector, uh, the Chinatown sector. And that gave, and so the premier, prime, so the prime minister, who's very pro-CCP, um, invited in the Australians to restore peace. And at the time, everybody was like, oh, that's, you know, great. Well, not everybody, some were, you know, he was turning to Australia instead of his good buddy China. Next slide. And the Australians bit and sent in forces, which gave an opening for the Chinese to come in and say, well, the Australians have sent, you know, security forces. And actually, it was the Chinese who were targeted. So, you know, it'd be good if the Chinese did as well. And this was the initial framing for, next slide please, what blew up in the region, which is this Solomon Islands China Security Agreement. And that's probably why a lot of you are sitting in the room. Because when this came out, and there was discussions about whether this would lead to a base and the Solomons, all this sort of stuff, people got very, very concerned. And in the document, um, this is the, we only, we've only seen the draft, but it included things like bringing the Chinese to maintain social order, to protect Chinese citizens in major projects. And then that was followed up by uh, two other documents for the region as a whole, or the countries that recognize China, uh, a proposed China Pacific Islands countries common development vision, which sounds a lot like that East Asia co-prosperity sphere. And that was supported by a five year plan on common development. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna go through this slide, but these are just elements that we saw in those two documents to show you how comprehensive this is. They're talking about a China Pacific Island free trade area, shared future in cyberspace, um, la fingerprinting labs, forensics, all, that, all in these documents. Next slide, please. The people of the region, as you saw from the beginning, know geopolitics, and they knew what they were looking at. The president of the Federated States of Micronesia put out a letter to his co, co other Pacific Island leaders saying, this is the single most game-changing proposed agreement in the Pacific in any of our lifetimes. And he knows what he's looking at. He said, I'm aware that the bulk of Chinese research vessel activity in his country, FSM, has followed our nation's fiber optic cable infrastructure. He knows they're spying on them. And he also knows, this is what he's saying, <clears throat> that what we are seeing is an attempt to shift those of us with diplomatic relations with China very close to Beijing's orbit, intrinsically tying the whole of our economies and societies to them. The practical impacts, however, of Chinese control to our security space, aside from the impacts on our sovereignty, is that it increases the chances of China getting into conflict with Australia, Japan, the United States, New Zealand on the day when Beijing decides to invade Taiwan. Next. To be clear, he wrote, China's long-term goal is to take Taiwan peacefully, if possible, through war if necessary. They know they're part of the strategic architecture of, Jap of Japan, of, sorry, of, of China taking Taiwan. It would interdict Japan. It would cut off Australia. You can't, J Ta Taiwan is not the end point. If you take Taiwan, you need to secure, have the whole region secure, as we saw during World War II. Other leaders in the region also have seen this. Next slide, please. This is uh, the governor that uh, Colonel Newsom was just mentioning. He's just sent a letter to President Biden uh, where he said, uh, I believe strongly and urgently that you should know about the outside forces that are tearing us apart, threatening the existence of our democratic government and overtaking one of the United States' most strategic assets in the Western Pacific Ocean. Some call Yap the tip of the spear. He's the governor of Yap, or was the governor of Yap. I've always looked at the U.S. with profound gratitude, respect, and great admiration as the North Star, guiding light for our democratic values and principles. However, the U.S. created welfare states in many of these islands by not demanding accountability and cessation of corruption. There is a big role for the United States here to do the things that it believes in. Support, democracy, transparency, accountability, rule of law. Next slide. Because if it doesn't, these are the countries that uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi visited on his recent trip to the region. These are the economic zones in red. He is m moving, not only we talked about the east-west movement of moving the, the front line off the coast of, off that first island chain to the coast of Hawaii. They're actively trying to potentially put in place their own island chain that would block off allies like Australia. 
right? If you put in this sort of dual use fishing fleet that you're talking about, things like that, it becomes very difficult to operate in that region. So next slide, please. So looking back at that map of the battles of World War II, you can realize how congested this space is and uh, what, how big a problem we have going forward. And Colonel Newsham is going to tell you how to solve it. OK, if I had really figured it out, I would trademark it and retire. Uh, now, what is it we're trying to accomplish? You know, look out 10 years. You know, what do you want the region to look like? And, and really, what you want are stable, independent countries that are able to withstand uh, Chinese domination uh, with the help of the United States and our friends. And I think if you were to take a vote on these islands, that is what people would like. But often they do feel it's like they've, they've got no choice, and what else can they do? Uh, and that's partly a function of the United States having not paid enough attention to the region. Uh, the expression benign neglect was in fact coined uh, to characterize the, how the U.S. has handled the region. But what, can we, what, what are some specific things that we can do? The first thing you have to do is be there. Uh, you have got to have embassies and consulates all over the place. You have to have them properly staffed and by the first string, uh, not by the people whose request to go to Vienna and enjoy the, uh, the coffee culture was rejected. Uh, but if you're not there, people will, they'll, take, they'll get the message that you're not all that interested. Uh, the US military as well, I touched on them earlier, that uh, in the last 10 years that I know of, there have been four instances when they have been offered either bases or real access, or the equivalent of bases in the region. In, they turned them all down. Uh, and that is just, it's perplexing. You can't keep doing that. You, know, you have, as I say, the, the military has to, uh, has to be there. But there is also a commercial angle to all of this. You know, we talk about diplomacy and the military, but there's a commercial part. And you'll, you'll notice how the Chinese use the commerce so effectively. Uh, the U.S., well, the, the days of the Yankee trader seem to be long gone. Uh, but there are, thing, there are things you can do. And I would suggest that Congress ought to call up the Department of Commerce, get the Foreign Commercial Service over here and say, well, what are we going to do? Uh, FCS has done some good work. The, the Subic Bay deal recently with, uh, that f uh, preempted a Chinese company trying to buy a ship repair facility. Uh, there was some SC FCS involvement, uh, but it shows what's doable. Uh, additionally, give some support to local uh, journalists. If you go around the islands, you'll see how embattled they are and how diligent a lot of them are, and particularly in exposing corruption. Uh, additionally, one th if, if there's one thing we have to do, it's resolve the COFA agreements. Uh, the amounts of money we're talking about, as I understand it, at issue are about $200 million, which I would suggest any helicopter that flew out of Afghanistan at the very end of it uh, with an Afghan minister, and it probably had a lot more on it than that. Uh, it's not much money, but if you don't solve it, what message does it send? It, it shows that in America just isn't all that committed, not all that interested, but, and it's an easy thing to do. Uh, you got to do that. Additionally, get the, the atomic test, the nuclear test compensation, get that resolved as well. And once again, it'll have a ripple effect and will improve the U.S., uh, the way it's regarded in the region. Uh, additionally, you might offer a COFA agreement to some other states like Nauru, uh, Kiribati, and, uh, uh, and Tuvalu. Uh, I think there'll be some real interest in that. Uh, additionally, Another idea that's been posed for the, the COFA states is why not have them set up their own National Guards and have the American military get in and help them with that. Uh, and that would be a very good way to have this permanent presence. And in terms of the permanent presence, one idea that's, uh, that I would recommend is uh, get small groups of Marines, for example, who are bored doing whatever they're doing, uh, led by young officers, get them out into the islands permanently uh, where they do things like small boat operations and patrolling. Uh, and you're, you have this presence, and, and say it has, this, it has a psychological effect on the local population. Uh, additionally, uh, apply some intelligence resources to the region. Uh, it doesn't get many from the, uh, from the U.S., as far as I can tell, and apply it to things like the, the Chinese subversion, to the corruption, uh, and expose it to high heaven. And that is what local people actually want. And it's not hard to figure out when you have the Prime Minister of uh, Solomon Islands who's moved a ton of money into Sydney real estate. Uh, this isn't hard to find. 
Uh, but you expose this stuff, and it gives the people on our side, it gives the people who don't want to be dominated, it gives them some, uh, some oxygen, gives them something to work with. Uh, but that would be a, a nice thing to see, would be have CIA case officers interested in going to the Pacific uh, and NSA and Department of Treasury uh, do, could easily do some good work out there. Uh, don't outsource your foreign policy or your military presence uh, to other countries. You know, it's the United States were big enough to, to handle it. Uh, infrastructure development is an absolute pressing need throughout the region. Uh, there's no reason that uh, we can't actively get involved there. And in fact, this get our partners involved in it as well. The Japanese a few years ago were sort of begging the Americans uh, to help them out with, uh, get an, with an infrastructure development scheme along the first island chain. Uh, and, and the Japanese have the know-how and the money and the Americans, they just want us to get involved. Unfortunately, no interest. But, you have to, but we have partners who do want to get involved. Uh, the Japanese, the, uh, the, the Australians, and the, the South Koreans. Uh, have a quiet presence in the region, have done some good work uh, on um, healthcare development, uh, climate change monitoring, et cetera. And there's opportunity, and they've, devote, you know, they've donated trucks to uh, Vanuatu. You know, so for example, we will sometimes, we'll offer them, I don't know, a course in good governance or something. And the Chinese will give three, three school buses to move the children from one place to another or a boat to get from one island to the next. We ought to be doing both. Uh, but we have friends who can help us out there and, and really want to do this. Uh, Taiwan has a role to play. And the Indians actually are, have a real opportunity because they can, they can compete economically more easily than, say, some of the, the American companies can. Um, but so those are, say, some very quick ideas as to tangible, concrete things that we can do. Um, now this is, and another thing that's been mentioned recently, you know, just the Quad has um, talked about a scheme for going after the dark fleets, these Chinese fishing boats that vacuum the oceans. Uh, and that, obviously, there's a vulnerability for the Chinese in terms of their environmental depredations that we don't, we don't run wild with. Greenpeace doesn't say a word. But anyway, back to the dark fleets. Um, it's a great idea uh, and you know, to have the, the Quad uh, share its resources, get uh, commercial satellite technology, and, and go after these fleets. But there's one small problem, and that's who's going to do it. Nobody wants to take the job. Now, the Navy doesn't want to do it because they don't go after fishermen. Uh, it's not what navies do. The Coast Guard is much too small. But we do have partners who can get involved. But as I said, somebody has to be responsible for this, and someone has to be responsible for the entire uh, effort in the Pacific. Uh, as well, I, and uh, there's been a lot of proposals recently and speeches made, but I can't tell which individual is responsible for the success or failure uh, of it. As I said, somebody needs to, uh, one, be responsible, but also there has to be some a clear uh, sort of lines of effort and s a sense of who's going to actually do what. Um, I would suggest that we might learn something about political warfare. Uh, we used to know it in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and you know, I would, if you need to ask what it is, I think it gives you a sense of just how far um, behind we are. But the Chinese do it. You combine commercial, political, diplomatic, military, uh, every uh, lever of national power. And finally, um, this all has to come together in a systematic plan. And I would suggest that somewhere in the, the administration or in somewhere there is a plan that was made a few years ago. Uh, that, actually that actually says, this is what we are going to do in the Pacific region. This is our campaign plan. I think if you bro dusted that off, it would give some good ideas as to uh, how, go how to go about it. Um, so that very quickly is solving all the region's problems. And we have a few minutes for uh, questions, and we certainly welcome those. Thank you, Grant and Kale. Uh, we don't have a wireless mic, but we have a mic for the camera. So when you ask your question, please speak up so the um, so everybody can hear. So, Q and A session. Anyone? Okay, in the back. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering. So, can you just speak part? up? Yeah. Um, so others can hear. Yeah. Um, combating uh, influence in the region. Um, um, let me word it right. Um, so combating influence in the region where. Uh, China doesn't have a present, you know, that's one issue. But how do you combat the presence of Chinese if you want to have influence on a certain island, but China already has influence on that island? Can you, can you combat that? Can you find a way to go after that? Well, well, 
just quickly, and then I'll pass over to Brent because Brent knows this a lot better. So they really want more U.S. engagement, right? That, that China is is has its traction because there's um, because they don't seem to have any viable alternatives. What Australia and New Zealand have been doing in the large parts of the area hasn't been working effectively for the people of the region. It does. It really doesn't take much. And uh, as we saw from the governor of Yap, he just he wants the U.S. to do the things that that should be doing anyway, helping to expose corruption. Basically, the Chinese are, are in there in large degree because of illicit activity. If you help the local media, if you help the local prosecutors, if you give them the information, they will fight it on their own. They want their country clean. We've seen a lot of very brave people. Sui Dani, for example, you know, he wouldn't take the money. Um, and he ended, up, he ended up going to Taiwan for his medical treatment. So even though Taiwan didn't have a relationship with the Solomons at that point, they maintained that principles, values-based relationship, especially with individuals who believe the same things they do. And the U.S. can certainly do the same and much, much more. Yeah, and in doing the getting the, the COFA agreements done, uh, once again, it, it shows you give some real um, support to the, the people who don't want Chinese domination. Because they can say, look, the Americans have come through with us and we've got this money now. Uh, and that's fundamentally important, but also you, you have to be there. You know, there's simply no easy way around that. But when you find when, the, when we are, that the things turn right. Uh, and exposing the corruption is absolutely essential. If you don't do that, you probably reduce your prospects of success uh, by a, a lot. Uh, so, but they, they, at the end of the day, if you say, if you go to these islands, that Chinese are not that popular. Uh, it's, that's something that works to our favor. Uh, but we do have to be there actually, you know, presenting the locals with some, you know, some sort of an alternative to it. Uh, one of the, the president of, of Micronesia, uh, this was a few years ago, he was overheard saying, you know, we don't do this by choice. We do it because we have no other option. Uh, so but it's, it's, I say it's not a hard one to win, but you do have to be there. And I would just add that Congress has been very, very helpful on the COFA stuff. It was dragging for a really long time, and about half a dozen bipartisan letters went to the White House demanding uh, a negotiator be appointed. The COFAs are renewed every 20 years, so we're in that phase now. And, uh, and as a result of those letters, they have the White House did appoint a designated negotiator, and negotiations have restarted. So Congress, there, there, are, there are a lot of people here who, who do understand what's at stake and have been working very effectively in a very bipartisan way on this topic, and, and we're grateful. Yeah, I would really stress that there are some Congress, like Ed Case from Hawaii, for example, just to name one, are really excellent. You read the letters that they write, the things they're trying to do. Uh, and so there's an understanding. Just need to get that ball across the, the goal line. Uh, so it shouldn't be impossible. Question over here. Uh, good afternoon first, thank you. Uh, Professor Kiora. Uh, this is in line, we, talk, we keep talking about friends and then we also talk about presence. So we have the traditional spheres of influence through Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia. Uh, there are reports that some of the Pacific Islands kind of have an imperialistic hangover with some of the uh, primarily Australia and New Zealand, but we still defer to them so much for those areas. And it seems like we're apprehensive to go into an area that's traditionally into PNG because that's supposed to be Australia's backyard. Is that hindering us and is there a way for us to get past that or is it just a sensitive subject that we're going to continue to, to ride the line with? I'll start. It's as hard as we want to make it. Uh, the Americans ought to be everywhere. You know, we're big enough and there's enough of us. And we, we are regarded differently than say Australians and New Zealanders are in certain places just as Indians are regarded differently than us. Um, but it, as and I made that comment about outsourcing our foreign policy and our military presence, uh, that is dangerous. You saw that we did it in Tonga after the uh, volcano last year or earlier this year. And we just left because it's Australia's air territory, France's, it's somebody else's. The Americans sent eventually something like they sent a destroyer to help with humanitarian assistance disaster relief. The Chinese sent two ships, two aircraft a fishing boat uh, quicker. Uh, so I think us, I say outsourcing is a huge mistake and can it easily be addressed? Yeah, so I'm gonna uh, just explain what, what was just asked because it's a really important question and it has to do with the, fi with the five eyes. So, um, so this, this area is largely <coughs> divided, sorry, people on that side, 
into uh, a Micronesia, which is kind of this, the area up top, which is where the U.S. has its, you know, it's where the COF is and all that stuff is. Then uh, uh, Melanesia, which is this kind of arc around Australia, which is where the Solomons are. And then Polynesia, which is sort of this area. And under the, under five eyes, that, and especially after the end of the Cold War when the U.S. was losing interest, Melanesia sort of went to Australia, Polynesia went to New Zealand, and the U.S. sort of stayed involved in, in Micronesia. And, um, and there, have, there have been some very big announcements made lately by Kirk Campbell, for example, um, and by the, by the Vice President uh, at the Pacific Island Forum just last week about en engagement in the region. Um, uh, some of it is, is very encouraging, like new embassies for uh, Tonga and uh, Kiribati. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with subsuming U.S. policy under the Pacific Island Forum, where the U.S. isn't even a full member, and which is perceived in the region to be heavily <coughs> dominated by Australia and New Zealand. So not only does it subsume U.S. policy to Australia and New Zealand, but it focuses on the southern half of the Pacific and not even on the northern half. Five Micronesian countries a year ago said they were going to leave the Pacific Island Forum. Two of them now have. One of them may come back, and the other three... Two, two of them are now looking to rejoin the forum because they're so scared of China, not because they love the forum. Um, so yes, I think uh, kind of a reassessment from the perspective not only of U.S. needs and interests, but what the islands want, which is direct bilateral relationship that is mediated through third parties that have their own baggage. We'll take one more question. Um, He's been waiting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I was just going to ask, um, you guys mentioned briefly that China was trying to reach Latin America. Um, you know, we are aware that like China's present in African nations. Do you think they're just trying to reach everywhere? Are they trying to do the, like, and do you think, has U.S. like attempted to stop it in those other regions, like in Latin America, in those African nations? Uh, you raised a very important point, and you do have to look at the entire map. And I could have kept going from Latin America all the way across to Africa, uh, where the Chinese are setting, they've got potential for base access uh, on the east side of uh, Latin America, on the west side of Africa, on the east side of Africa, and the right side of the Indian Ocean, pretty much everywhere. And that's the idea. And it's, say, it's not just the Pacific. And it may take some time, but when, you're, when they're building seven uh, Navy ships for every one we are, and you can do the math, and they've already got a lot more than us, their <coughs> Air Force uh, is getting more capable, but you've got all this potential access. And the idea is to eventually lock up uh, the entire globe. Uh, are we doing anything to stop it? Uh, well, go to Latin America and see. It, it, we're not doing what we need to do, not even by a stretch. Um, people <coughs> have been raising the alarm for a long time. Uh, they haven't uh, been paid attention to. Evan Ellis is very good on Latin America. Africa as well. You know, we do things, but the Chinese are backfooting us, and it's the same basic problem that we describe in the islands you see everywhere else. And the answer, to the response to it is, should be the same. Uh, but for some reason, we have a hard time uh, getting our act together. Uh, the one advantage we have is that most in most parts of the world, American people like us. Uh, and that, that's helpful if we just show the interest, but also if you've got to get that corruption and subversion right. Uh, otherwise, it's a, a hard thing to handle. But, and it isn't just east to west. You've got north to south, and Antarctica and the Arctic are <coughs> similarly in play. Uh, but say the game's not over, but say, we've, um, we've made it harder for ourselves than it should be. Well, let's give a big round of applause to Grant and Cleo. <laughs> Very important topic. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, please stay tuned for our next uh, luncheon, will be, which will be held in September. So if you're not on our list, please make sure you drop your card or sign in the table outside. And we have a lot of lunch uh, left over, so please take a bag if you want uh, something for dinner, especially you interns. Just leave 10 bags for our staffs. Thank you very much. See you in September. Thank you. Have a nice day.